welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Phil Arno. Unless you've been living under a rug for the last 30 some years, you can't help but be worried about global warming. I mean, climate change. Hurricanes, forest fires, tornadoes. Well, you get the picture. No matter who I talk to on the street, climate change is a concern. And why not? Every day we hear the message. New York City, Los Angeles, Florida. They're all going to disappear, covered up by the rising oceans. Just yesterday, I was looking at the news, and here's some of the uh, headlines. Um, higher temperatures are going to affect the economy in ways previously not understood. Rising levels of carbon dioxide lead to nutritional deficiencies in hundreds of millions. Brett Kavanaugh has a nearly perfect record of speeding up extinction. I love that one. Well, that's the message. We're all going to suffer if the next Supreme Court nominee gets in. Your chances of being extinct are going to speed up. Some of us will suffer because of droughts, some because of floods, some of us are going to die because of heat exhaustion. Some of us are going to freeze to death. Wait, freeze? Oh, that's right. When we experience ultra-cold temperatures and winters, very harsh winters, that's all part of global warming, too. Forget about the logic. Just be afraid. Be very afraid. Because every expert in the world agrees humans are causing the end of everything. But is that really true? Actually, there are thousands of highly respected experts that don't agree. But we don't often hear about any of that. Why not? Well, with me today, via Skype, is Mark Morano. He's the founding editor of the award-winning website climatedepot.com. Uh, we have a book here that he wrote, yes. The <laughs> Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change. And it says right here on the cover, Mark is evil personified because he's a climate denier. Mark, are you there? <laughs> yes, I am, Phil. Thank you for having me on. I'm here in the heat of the Washington, D.C. area. It's about 94 degrees and high humidity. No doubt a heat wave caused by man-made global warming. So I'm, I'm, take, I'm, I'm enjoying it here in the field for you for this interview. And of course, those temperatures in Washington are rare, right? I mean, it's only because of uh, climate change that uh, you're experiencing that extra heat in the, in the uh, Washington area, right? Yes, and this is one of the, the funniest aspects of this climate debate, is there's no way to falsify their theory. Record snow, record cold are all due to global warming. The lack of hurricanes, due to global warming. A number of hur bad hurricanes, due to global warming. And they'll just, no matter what it is. So what they'll say is, if it's a, used to say, if it's a cold day, well, you can't just use one day. That's a climate change is a trend over many years. And then you have a short-term heat wave. Oh, this is what climate change looks like. They just bounce around all over the place. And no, to answer your question specifically, as I detail in the book on heat waves, heat waves were much worse in the 1930s in the United States. And the EPA under Obama actually had the charts on the website that showed the highest temperature record breaking in the continental U.S. were by far in the 1930s, not recent years. Yeah, right. In 1934, 35, 36, yeah. those are still the record holders for the, the warmest time in this country since they started keeping records. So uh, I, we'll just have to ignore that for now to, uh, yeah. to uh, uh, believe the, uh, the climate change uh, scenario. Uh, one of the things that is behind this climate change message is uh, it's not very obvious. It's, it's because there's a, a political agenda uh, and, a, and a money incentive as well. I mean, people won't get grants if there's nothing that's wrong. And, and you know, that's part of, the, part of the problem is you're only going to get money and grants and further your career if you can find a problem with the climate. Yes, in fact, my book, one of the most important chapters is about the intimidation of anyone who dissents. First of all, if you don't go along with that, your career is ruined. If you dare challenge any part of the consensus, they will literally 
drive you out of academia. I have detailed stories of state climatologists from Delaware, from Virginia, from Colorado, uh, who were literally essentially attempted to be forced or forced out of their positions because they, were de they did not go with the United Nations Al Gore view. And I also detail how, as you just as you mentioned, if you say, like the United Nations in 1988 started this uh, climate panel and their goal was to look at how carbon dioxide impacted the climate. Well, if they found that carbon dioxide was not the control knob of the climate, then they would, have, they would cease to have a reason to exist. They would then no longer be in having international conferences in Cancun, in Bali, in Kenya, in South America, all over the world. And, and they would also not be in charge of proposing the solutions to the problem. So when it comes to academia, if you're a scientist and you want attention for, say you study butterflies and no one's paying attention to your research, do a study on what might may could happen to butterflies 100 years from now and come up with some modeling prediction that says butterflies could be doomed. Suddenly, you're going to get media, you're going to get research staff, you're going to get funding, you're going to get invited to UN climate summits in exotic locations. That's how they draw in. And these scientists aren't necessarily corrupt, but they're just playing with the science funded of the day. They're taking the money to say, okay, how could climate impact butterflies? How could it impact trees? How could it impact food? And suddenly climate's everywhere. And so then the media says, look, all these scientists are concerned about it, but they're not actually dealing with the central issue of whether they should be concerned about it and the roots for how this happened. This was literally an agenda started in the late 1960s and they've had plug and play environmental scares from overpopulation to resource scarcity to global cooling to deforestation. And they've just changed the scare, but the solutions have always been the same, which is more government control, global international treaties, loss of sovereignty, and essentially a war on capitalism. And that's what we're doing now. Just this week, the UN Secretary General commissioned a report saying that capitalism is dooming the climate and we have to come up with a new way to basically a new economic way to govern the earth because of climate change. It's the same people that were trying the same things in the 1960s and 70s. They're just using the climate scare to achieve these political ends. Well, you know, funny you should say that uh, it's, it's, it's a war on capitalism. I, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine, a relatively intelligent uh, uh, man. He's a real estate agent. His first name is Eric, but I'm not going to give his last name because I want to avoid a lawsuit. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't believe in climate, uh, that there are any deniers. He doesn't believe that there's any credibility to right. anyone who thinks that climate change isn't a serious problem. And the, I, the, there was nothing I can say to him that would convince him, basically because the message that he's been hearing for 30 years is that it's real and it's dangerous. and I brought up with him uh, a man, his name is Patrick Moore, and you, you're familiar yeah. with him. He, he was one of the co-founders of uh, Greenpeace. Certainly no you know, conservative far right winger. You know, this guy is an environmentalist. And it, I've got a sound bite from him, and I think it puts it in perspective. When I heard the sound bite, it really made sense to me, and maybe it'll make sense to the viewers. If we can pull that up. When I left Greenpeace, it was in the midst of them adopting a campaign to ban chlorine worldwide. Like I said, you guys, this is one of the elements in the periodic table, you know. I mean, I'm not sure if that's in our jurisdiction to be banning a whole element. Destroying the, wall were soon the other reason that environmental extremism emerged was because world communism failed, the wall came down, and a lot of peaceniks and political activists moved into the environmental movement, bringing their neo-Marxism with them and learn to use green language in a very clever way to cloak agendas that actually have more to do with anti-capitalism and anti-globalization than they do anything with ecology or science. Now, that's just one person who is very credible, and he explains what he thinks the origin, and this goes basically to what you said. It, you know, the people who are neo-socialists, they, they had to go somewhere after the Soviet Union collapsed. And what better way to control the economies of the world and fight against capitalism than have a cause? And the cause is saving humanity, saving the earth. Now, who could possibly argue with that? So they really came up with an argument that, you know, 
is a real winner for them. And then they, they kind of added to the whole thing by saying, you know, if it's cold, it's global warming. And if it's hot, it's global warming. Yes. And if there's extreme, you know, extreme weather, it's because of global warming. When in effect, and I think you mentioned this in your book, the, the, the trends over the last 30 years since they've started talking about this uh, actively, uh, there are no trends. It, it's perfectly in line with everything that's gone before since we started keeping records. Yes, in fact, yeah, let's talk about the science for a minute here. First of all, absolutely, we are not outside of what you'd call natural variability to the point of, and in the book, I have a whole chapter detailing that during the, the Roman warming period, during the time of Jesus Christ walked the earth, roughly about you know, zero, one AD, uh, in that time frame, the earth was as warm or warmer, probably much warmer during the Roman warming period. During the medieval warming period from about 900 to 1300 AD, we were as warm or warmer. So depending on where you want to start your chart, we've actually cooled since the Roman warming period or the, middle, the, the, the medieval warming period. However, uh, what, what, what happens here is the modern instrumentation, what happened was modern thermometers came on in 1850. So if, if to look at the charts now, we have warm since the end of the Little Ice Age, which is 1850, when New York Harbor was frozen over. A lot of the glaciers that everyone talks about melting had melted by 1900, long before they could ever blame man-made CO2 because of the natural warming trend. So since thermometer data of the late 19th century began, we have warm. But that's not saying anything because if you look at the bigger picture, We've cooled. And also, I point out in the book, I interview University of Pennsylvania geologist Dr. Robert Giegengack, and he points out that throughout, throughout most of the Earth's history, 90% of Earth's history has been warmer than today. In other words, we're in the 10% coldest history of the Earth, geologically speaking. The, the previous 90% could not support uh, ice at either pole. So there's nothing unprecedented. Now, beyond temperature, have polar bears, which are at near record highs. In fact, the U.S. Geological Survey says they may be overpopulated. You have um, the, uh, sea level, which is not accelerating. I, I also point out in the book, there's dueling data sets. You have satellite gauges, you have uh, tidal gauges. Depending on which data set you use, you can, and what trend line and where you begin your trend, you can try to scare the people, but there's absolutely no acceleration. Then you look at storms, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, droughts. And not only are they not increasing, but they're either stable or on declining timescales. Even the California drought. California had much worse droughts in past centuries. And globally, we're in a declining trend on droughts for 60 years. Tornadoes, add on near record lows. Big, huge decline in big tornadoes since the 1950s. Uh, floods, no trend in over 100 years in the peer-reviewed data. So this is the, this is the issue that we have to deal with is people come out with unscientific claims, oh, the weather is much worse than it used to be. It's not true. There's nothing unusual happening. So in the book, I profile prominent scientists. I go through how the 97% of all scientists agree called consensus is literally nonsense. One of the studies isn't even 97 scientists. It was 77 anonymous scientists. Well, when we come back, we're out of time in this segment, but when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the the ways that they structure the message so that you really, it, it pulls on your heartstrings or it makes you afraid. And, and they structure the message in such a way that you just can't ignore it. And because the message is so often in your face, it's just, it, it's kind of a win-win for the uh, climate uh, change uh, <laughs> proponents. Anyway, we'll be back right after this message. We'll continue the conversation with Mark Morano uh, of Climate Change, or let's see, of uh, ClimateDepot.com. Very good website, I recommend it. We'll be back right after this.